Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 196 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park, D producing back there somewhere. And our guest tonight on the show is Vivek Jacob, who retired as a major in Nine Para. It's uh, one of India's special operations units. And he also is involved with Claw Global, or uh, you can find them at claw.global. Uh, which is an endeavor he, we'll have him talk about extensively on the show that um, gets together Indian military veterans um, and helps guys out uh, in, in his home country. Um, so we're very excited to have you on the show tonight, Vivek. Uh, I, I, I love talking to the uh, foreign special operations partners, and uh, we really mm -hmm. look forward to hearing your insights. Roger, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a, it's a it's, it's an honor actually to be able to you know interact uh, like this and get the word out about you know our thoughts and the way we operate and what the common commonality is about you know the way we think around the world how military vets commonly think around the world there's just a different you know community absolutely yeah, yeah. well if we could start from the top of uh, Vivek uh, I, I'd love to hear about kind of your upbringing uh, how you grew up and sort of what the path was that took you towards military service. Okay, that's a, a pretty you know straightforward story. Uh, you know, I was born into a military family. My father was also in the in the army. My you know all my uncles etc. Everybody in my from my dad's side was in the army or slash the navy, and my grandfather was also in the army. So, but that's not the reason why I joined the <laughs> joined the army. Um, I actually wanted to join the the merchant navy and travel the world and you know you know see see the world around outside. But uh, uh, I had a you know uh, I, we required a six by six eyesight back then to join join the merchant navy. So my eyesight was a little weak, so I couldn't join that. But I, uh, my second option therefore was to join the armed forces, and uh, I was you know uh, we had a you know little bit of trouble when when we were younger with you know my parents got separated and things like that so we had a you know fallout as far as our financial situation was concerned so um, i had the responsibility of uh, you know uh, you know looking after my mom and all of that very early on so like in what eighth ninth grade i had to you know kind of make sure that i make it so since um, uh, I was, you know, soon as I was finishing finishing my class twelfth in uh, here in India, and I had to, you know, get into a line of work where if I couldn't earn the money, at least I should not be dependent on my parents. So, so it was the merchant navy or it was the army. So I went into the army. <laughs> That's how it happened. It is. Is there in India? Is there a large military culture? Is it something that? A lot of people do, or, or like, what percentage of the population do you would you say goes in the military? Yeah, so we have a uh, uh, we have a the military is a very attractive, uh, you know, uh, uh, choice of uh, life or choice of service uh, in India, and uh, percentage population, I you know. I'll be taking a guess, but yeah, we have with yeah, but well, pretty, pretty, you know, let's say about 15, 20 percent of the youngsters who, you know, they're pretty, and it's it's like a wave, you know, sometimes when it's like what catches trend amongst the, you know, the young, the young kids when they're getting into a profession. So at, there are times when, when the military profession starts, you know, becoming very attractive and, you know, people get fired up and things like that. So you, you know, it, it's like, a, you know, it shifts up and down, but uh, overall, uh, uh, we have a very, uh, the military is very respected uh, in our country, very, very uh, strongly respected by the public. Uh, 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 and uh, not only just, just the profession, but the way of life of the military, the military culture is very respected in our country. So we have a, we have a pretty strong, uh, you know, 
young crowd which wants to join the army, yeah, mm -hmm. or the army. And could you tell us a little bit about what the journey was like for you? Um, because I mean, we we don't know as a, as Americans. I mean, we understand our system, but I would be really curious to hear about the the Indian system, what it's like joining the military, and you know, your path to becoming an officer as well. Okay, so there's uh, uh, there's twelfth grade. You know, you finish off your schooling uh, in twelfth grade. I don't know what the equivalent of that is back in the U.S. So high school, yeah, yeah. Se senior year of high school. Yeah. 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 So we, we finish off with that, you're what, about 16, 16 and a half, 17 uh, years old. And uh, there's, a, uh, there's a National Defense Academy that basically you can join immediately after 12th grade. And so you give an exam, they have an interview, psychological test, etc. It's pretty uh, comprehensive uh, and it lasts over a five day selection process. Uh, and then uh, you know, you go through your medicals, and then you get you know get selected. You go into the you go into the National Defense Academy. That's where you separate out. You know, first you have a, you know, it's, it's a three year training process. So and you graduate as well while you are training, and uh, uh, over a period of three years, uh, by the end of the, your uh, you know two years of training, you separate out into your specialized you know Army, Navy, or Air Force. And continue your training in, for another year in NDA, finish that off. Then you go off to your various academies. You go off to Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, or or the Indian Military Academy for the Army. And uh, you do a year longer specialization there. And then you get commissioned. So it's a total of post 12th grade. You're, you do a total period of four years of training. And uh, then you get commissioned as an officer. And yeah. That's, and Within that, I mean, obviously you gravitated towards army, but uh, did uh, I, I mean I'm cu I'm curious now to kind of uh, understand how the pathway goes to special forces. I mean, do you go into the infantry or artillery or or, or another specialty first? Uh, well, you have both the options available to you. You can directly, you know, right from the academy as soon as you're finishing off your training and you're, you're getting commissioned as an officer. You can you can directly volunteer for the special forces. It's a merit based thing, so you know um, uh, they, there's a merit list, and you know the top uh, people who you know apply for the SF get a chance straight up to go to the SF right after the academy, and then the, the unit itself. Then there's a selection, pro, you know, the probation and all of that goes on, and you know once you get selected, you can you know you get absorbed into the unit. Otherwise. Uh, uh, up to about three years of service. Even if you go into the infantry or any other arm within the army, you can, you know, uh, you can apply for the special forces and join in a little later as well. Yeah. What, what, what was your path to get there? I volunteered for the SF directly from academy. Yeah. So. Um, and uh, for our, our viewers who don't know, could you tell us a little bit about the Indian Special Operations Community and sort of the various units uh, that exist? Yeah, so um, broadly, all the three uh, wings, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force have their own Special Forces outfits. And uh, within the Army, uh, you know, and then, of course, then there's the National Security Guard, which uh, which which is outside the Armed Forces, but it, it's, it's like a anti-hijack and, you know, Counterterrorism kind of a unit, and uh, 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 within the army itself, uh, uh, we have uh, different units which specialize in different kinds of warfare based on the terrain. So, you know, but essentially, uh, more or less, <clears throat> everybody can fight in any which way in any kind of terrain. So, we cross specialize, do a lot of cross training. There's a lot of cross training that keeps going on. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, special ops guys, you know, anything, anywhere, anytime. So we train like that. Yeah. I mean, that's the mindset. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the commonality across all of the branches and all the units, right? Yeah. So, and, it, it, and, and for you, it was nine para. Yeah. Yeah. So nine para was, uh, is a unit which. Uh, Otherwise, uh, traditionally uh, specializes in mountain warfare and uh, mountain warfare, jungle warfare. Uh, uh, 
that's been the the erstwhile traditional uh, you know uh, specialization that that the unit itself developed but uh, over a period of time and with, with the way things are in the world today the the unit itself now you know has multiple specializations in you know the entire spectrum of conflict if you so to speak mm -hmm. did, now did yeah. you choose nine para or was it chosen like wh what is the selection process for special forces do you choose the unit before you go to selection or do you go to selection and then get put in the unit uh so um like i said it's 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 based there are very limited vacancies that come out for the special forces and and uh uh well you can choose but if the vacancy is available you'll get that uh, if the vacancy most likely these vacancies are not available because they're highly subscribed uh -huh. so so yeah but i did choose uh nine para act uh, and uh uh yeah i did get it and i did land up there yes. <laughs> And so what was it like when you first got there as, you know, a young, you were a young officer at the time, correct? Yeah, I was 21, I think, at that time. Yeah. yeah. So what was it like? What was it like? Uh, so I had no expectations as such. I had, I had no, uh, I had no uh, expectations or I had no, uh, you know, uh, I didn't calculate too much as in, you know, uh, what will happen if I don't make it this, that, etc, etc. I didn't think too much about all of that. I just, I was very inspired by, you know, by an officer we had who was our instructor, you know, our directing staff in the academy itself. He was from Nainvara and, uh, you know, you had to just look at the man to get inspired. So he was like that. <laughs> One look, I added him and I said, okay, that's, you know, that's where I'm going. So, so, uh, so when I did land up there, uh, I didn't really know anything much actually what goes on. You know, I, I didn't have a clue uh, at that time. This is back in, back in 2002, you know. So back in 2002, there wasn't so much, you know, internet and things like that. We were, you know, in academy as it is, you don't get any time. And straight out of academy into the special forces, straight into probation. And actually, I got a you know surprise when I landed up for probation. Probation uh, at that time used to be for three months, a three month period. But when I joined, it, it you know it converted into six months directly. So so I spent six months under probation, and I didn't really have time to think about whether I'll clear it or not clear it, or what will happen if I don't, and things like that. It was just uh, pretty intense when the whole thing was going on. The whole idea was to get through the next hour, the next hour, the next hour. So six months of getting through the next hour, and that's about it. Yeah. And I, I mean, could you tell us a little bit about like what it was like? I mean, uh, I assume taking a command and and suddenly you're in charge of all these special forces soldiers who are hardcore guys. I mean, what what was that like as a 21 year old officer? So in in nine para you don't get command you have to take command it's like that <laughs> yeah I, I suppose it's it's this is there must be just so much which is common in fact you know probably the entire game must be pretty common as far as the uh, SF community around the world is concerned you know you have to earn it so you have to you know it's it, it's your heart on the line and you have to you have to earn it you have to deserve it and because. Uh, SF operations, SF op operatives, SF operations need, uh, uh, it's a high stakes game. It's the ultimate stakes game. You know, I often compare special forces and uh, nuclear weapons and, uh, uh, you know, like fighter aircrafts, you know, like, you know, strategy. So basically the impact of a very small, highly trained force going and being able to execute something, um, in uh, in such a manner like overt covert or clandestine whichever way you know that it needs to be executed and to be able to do that and uh, 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 you know the nation's pride the nation's strategic interests interests you know all of that lies on your shoulders on your ability to execute what you're being tasked being being able to execute it to the highest uh, you know possible precision so and and ensuring the outcome so uh yeah so so in these kind of places uh you know your ranks don't carry too much weight 
especially early on so so when you come in you know you, the entire unit so the entire unit is involved in your selection process everybody is watching you you know so uh, and i was the and and in our case so everybody i'm sure it's like that uh, everywhere uh, where the officers and soldiers everybody trains together everybody is being probated together there's no you know there's no ranks being thrown around or or things like that and that very quickly gets into your blood stream and and, and into your mindset so and especially since i came directly from the academy so you know you don't uh, you don't develop any any airs or misnomers about what holding a rank means so it, it's just about you know it's it's a functionality so uh, it, it's it's a superstructure in which you you know these these various positions are created for uh, for efficiency in operations uh, you know not to spend time trying to dominate each other it's more about how a team can work in unison and work in an organized manner and operate so that's how it is how it translates on the ground as well so uh, uh, when you come in and you're being probated and you you're watched for these various you know traits on uh, how how confident are you in your own skin and you know if all the trappings are taken away from you what is the man that remains there mm -hmm. right so, so that's the, that's the thing and uh, and uh, that's very very closely watched and you know once you do clear the probation process uh, uh once you do clear the probation process and you you go into active operations you're assigned a team and you go into the team and and it's like this you know for the for the first two years you know every time we were going out for ops and that was at a very uh, a pr pretty you know high frequency we were operating you know every 3 4 days we were out so and sometimes going in for long duration operations and things like that so uh every night you know when you're getting ready so you know what are what are the soldiers would come with two two of these you know heavy duty rocket launchers you know with the rocket and he would hand it to me you know <laughs> so this is for you so basically that goes into your rucksack so so uh, often you'll find that the young officers who come into the unit are carrying far more weight than the soldiers in the team yeah and, and yeah so it's like that you know uh and and then they watch you they watch you in combat as well so for me actually it was a slightly different story i um uh i got probated for for double the probation period that is there so you know everybody had a lot of time to check me out so that that, that was one and uh since i was the only officer who was being probated at that point of time so the entire officer community was very very interested in me and used to take a lot of you know spend a lot of time with me so uh uh and and once i went in i was actually very fortunate i've always been very very fortunate you know uh, in life and especially uh, especially in my profession i was very fortunate um uh i i got to command a team uh, you know start got to start leading teams into operations very very early the situations kind of turned out like that you know it was pretty high intensity going on and uh, uh somehow my superiors uh took a you know kind of fate complete plus you know they kind of trusted me out uh, because the first time i went out i got into combat straight away so you know it, it doesn't happen very easily like that but but right from the word go i finished my probation came into the came into the teams uh, came went into my team and the first time my team went out and the first time i was in a in a squad my squad went into contact and uh, i saw that contact uh, you know i experienced that so right from the word go i i you know been very very fortunate to to have these experiences and and to you know always walk out walk away with you know having done what one does so like that yeah so it was a uh, very intense very interesting I, and it just kept building up and building up and building up like that just kept going higher yeah. i i got many more questions but dave if you want to give a shout out to uh yeah so tonight's sponsor uh is md hearing aids um for i mean for people who don't know like i wear hearing aids so i got to test these out actually um for a lot of people have been in combat and a lot of people have just been around like a lot of concerts or just normal industrial noises or whatever. Um, you know, he, our hearing goes a, as we age and losing your hearing is like, they've shown signs to early dementia. They've so, shown signs to like 
decrease cognitive ability. Um, but one of the problems is hearing aids are very, very expensive. Hearing aids, you know, run between four and eight thousand dollars generally. So MD Hearing was started by an ENT surgeon who wanted to make economical hearing aids uh, that anybody, you know, could afford and would benefit people. Um, <clears throat> so they have these great uh, behind the ear hearing aids, which I really like. They also have their Neos, which are in-ear hearing aids. It's the smallest uh, one they have. Uh, if you go to their, their website, uh, mdhearing.com, you can do an online hearing test. Um, and trust me, if, if you're having problems with your hearing, uh, find a solution because it's easy to laugh off, but it really does start to affect you know, how you see the world. Um, it's exhausting to try to make out you know, what people are saying. Um, but uh, so MD Hearing Aid is a great like uh, direct to consumer, affordable hearing aids. 45 days money back. So, you know, if you think they might work for you, give them a try. Um, if you want hear, uh, MD Hearing Aid, smallest hearing aid ever, uh, that's the Neo, these, um, go to mdhearing.com and use promo code TEAMHOUSE to get their new buy one, get one, $149 each offer when you buy a pair. Uh, plus, they're adding a free extra charging case. That's $100 value just for listeners of this show. So head to mdhearing.com and use your promo code TEAMHOUSE and get their new buy one, get one $149 each offer when you buy a pair. Um, I can't recommend enough taking care of your hearing. Uh, Vivek, back to you, man. Uh, I, I'm really uh, fascinated. I mean, I'm always fascinated to hear from far and soft partners and to learn so much about, you know, uh, the Indian special operations community and about your story. And I mean, you mentioned that your first time out on patrol, you got into a contact. I was wondering if, if you would be comfortable sharing some of that, what, what it was like that first patrol and, and what happened to you guys out there that day. Uh, okay. <laughs> So, uh, so we, special ops, uh, we hardly, uh, you know, unless, uh, you know, of course, the dynamics may be different uh, or must be different, I'm sure, for American SOF, uh, you know, uh, uh, going out on the kind of tactics that you guys deploy because you'll be, you know, operating in foreign lands. So, um, patrolling is like an area domination, right? You patrol to dominate the area. So, uh, Nine per SF, I don't think I've ever been on any patrol. It's it's target and hit. It's 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 you you have you go out uh, with very specific uh, this thing. There's no area domination. We don't dominate. It's what the regular infantry does and everybody else does. We are called in for special any anything that you know that's very specific. So uh, so yeah. So it was more of a a, a planned op. Uh, it was an uh, you know we'd, we'd gone in very uh, very specifically we had conducted surveillance over a you know a long period of time uh, about a week week and a half and then we went in and and I was supposed to sit on a sit on a hilltop and you know along with with the, the team commander and all of that and and listen listen to the radio so uh, and listen to what goes on you know there were two squads which are going into contact. And uh, the rest of the rest of the team was sitting up higher up in the mountains and and you know awaiting in case they were basically come providing cover to the two squads going in to take the hit. So uh, my team commander told me it was my first time out. So he told me to you know sit sit on the top of the mountain and and listen to everything. You know he, he used to call it listen to the cricket match, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so I was, uh, I was, uh, we were in position, and I was waiting, and and uh, there were two squads. They were passing right next to me. They were going down to take the hit next to the river, and uh, uh, and I just saw them going down, and the last guy passed, and I, I don't know, I just kind of, you know, got behind him and left the squad that I was assigned to. And I, I went, you know, sliding down behind them and I landed up uh, at the contact site. And then from there, I radioed my team commander that, you know, I'm here now. So and I knew he couldn't call me back because contact was about to start. It was 
it was about to take off so so there was nothing and it was straight completely at uh, you know he couldn't call me back and he said oh so okay sit tight so i was there and you know that's where it rolled so um yeah uh how was it contact is probably you know, it's, it's always very intense and always very in the moment you know there's no past there's no future there's no nothing you're just there and you're doing what you're doing and you know it's like your entire senses open up in the moment so so that was quite a thing you know to be completely in the moment at that point of time and totally expanded sense of awareness so yeah pretty intense can you uh tell us a little bit about like in the, in india can can the armed forces operate within the with within the country and uh, if you're not looking at external threats what what are what are some of the internal challenges that that you face okay so uh you know <clears throat> challenges you know challenges obviously you know the biggest challenge about any any sf operation for anybody i would presume would be to be you know precise with the the right target with the right amount of force no collateral damage you know so so that's always an issue when you're operating in populated areas and and uh, uh and especially if the populated areas are you know um uh, are dense and uh, so that's a challenge when you operate in in populated areas which are very dense and uh, there are your own people at the end of the day mm -hmm. there are the people you are protecting and things like that so being able so the whole and often intelligence is uh, you know uh, may not be very very precise or maybe absolutely wrong mm -hmm. you might be you know gunning for the wrong thing so all it's it's quite like a quagma you know it's like a you know you have to you have to navigate uh, as much as possible to really narrow it down so that when you do unleash you unleash on the right thing and you unleash the right amount so uh, that's uh, that, that's a challenge that we face a lot especially in the uh, counter insurgency counter terrorism grid in within the country mm. and uh, uh, the moment yeah so that's uh, that's a major challenge that one faces uh, and and then you know you 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 compensate by uh, by you know your drills keep evolving over a long period of time most you know most of our soldiers have been you know in doing this for about you know 15 20 odd years so there's a heck of a lot of experience goes in and what happens is over a period of time your your instincts start playing out you know you start because you spend so much time in combat you start operating beyond your five senses you're able to you know your your instinct becomes very very sharp your 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 six dimensional uh uh you know uh uh thought process or your 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 awareness reaches beyond your five senses you you know so, so all of that kind of comes into play and um, uh the you know so i have been very fortunate again that way you know very very clean i've had a very very clean uh, very very lucky very very uh, very very fortunate experience in, uh, in the operations that i have I've, i can personally you know we count so yeah the major challenge for everybody is being being able to operate it's the same for everyone i suppose being able to operate in tight situations and you know the, the right target you know and and no collateral damage you know uh, and things like that yeah urban areas are difficult in and in, in in the mountain terrain you know when you, when you're out there and you know you're 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 seeking in the mountains you're operating in the mountains there it's that the game is totally different and it's all about you know how how well you thought it all through before you really got into the mountains because in the mountains is you can't change too much you know right so the terrain is the same so you have to you have to have read analyze the terrain analyze the information that you have in, in such a way that when you do go in 
you know, you don't waste too much time climbing here and there. You go straight there and, you know, you know, and you're able to navigate in such a way that you don't get detected. So just the games are just very different. What would I call a challenge as such? Well, I've never really, you know, never really felt that there's any place that we did get stuck in. We were, like I said, was always we were always able to do what needed to be done and walk away with it without any issues as such. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that uh, this is a pretty eventful period of your time that the operations were coming at you guys pretty intensely. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to sort of your development as a, as a special operations officer, uh, as you gained more experience, as you gained the trust of the men that you were working with, you know, what, what was that, what was that experience like? Evolutionary. So, uh, we are born into a world where, where we ha we hardly know about what the sense is that we have, you know? We're born into a world where where we're where we are you know a bunch of books are thrown at us and a society tells us how to be and you're told that these are your limitations and this is this is this is this is what you've got at your disposal you know you got your five senses these this is what you have to do to be it's all about being successful in life and things like that so so with with that kind of a boxed uh mindset you know it, it is what you kind of your know, neural network forms like that you you're you you get boxed into it and uh, your ability to think uh gets boxed what you know about yourself is boxed but when you go into the special forces and and it's it's a constant you know dance going on between life and death life and death life and death it's it's every time you go out uh, for an operation uh, is a 50 50 percent chance always you know you know you, you have to <coughs> Uh, it, it's it's probably a person who's not seen too much of combat would think that you you know that the, that the odds are any different because uh, when bullets start flying you know it's it's anybody's game after that so anyway so when you're constantly living on the edge of this you know this fleeting moment in the now when you can when you can when you can die the very next moment or you know the the reverse happens you know you get what you're going out for so you your senses start opening up you know you're you're so much into the moment and the moment is like a doorway in, into your higher self kind of a thing you know you 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 your uh, the the will to survive and the and the 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 mindset to execute what you have been tasked to do to the highest possible you know uh, outcome uh, all of these kind of things happening in the moment simultaneously and and an intense contact going on uh, in the moment at that point of time uh, you kind of jump you jump out of your five senses and you go into your sixth sense and you, and you, and you start operating from there once so once that portal you know that portal of consciousness opens up uh, and it stays with you. It stays with you in life. You know, it, it start. You can. You, it starts widening and widening. The more time you spend in contact, the more time you spend in operations. The more time you are you are into high intense, high intensity combat. This portal keeps becoming wider and wider and wider. So your kind of your limited, uh, your consciousness or your awareness, which is limited by by your neural network, your present neural network. It kind of you know, there's a crack that develops. And you go into the six senses and basically your awareness starts flooding that. Mm -hmm. So you start becoming much more aware of what's going on and you and uh, and you evolve uh, or rather you start realizing your potential much more. It starts off in probation itself. You know, when you're pushed beyond your body limits, you're pushed beyond something that you thought you couldn't do. And you're being constantly pushed and pushed and pushed. And when you get pushed around like that for six months, both in mind and body, you evolve. There is, you know, to survive, you have to evolve. So, so it's like that. And uh, so it was, it was a constant um, journey of evolution for me throughout in this, in the SF. And there's just so much you learn, you know, when you, when you see death up close and you see it up close frequently, a lot of the bullshit in life starts falling away. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, so uh, a lot of the things that, that you thought uh, about yourself, you know, you thought about uh, about other people and things like that. They just uh, they just kind of melt away, and you are able to see what is actually there within you. 
and and uh, you know you uh, 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 you just evolve as a human being, both physically, psychologically, uh, spiritually, even you know after a certain point of time, you start realizing that the kind of things that that you are able to experience and the kind of uh, the awareness that's developing that is that spiritual in nature. It's actually a high intensity, you know, a, a, a well experienced uh, combatant. Uh, uh, would very very soon start realizing different realms of our existence because you kind of every time you know go beyond the whole life and death thing every time you go out you could die so you know that gets sparked so you're always in the moment so it's, it's a constant evolution and uh, you learn some real things you know about yourself uh, there's a lot of humility that develops right because you recognize your weaknesses you know and uh, your you start seeing that okay this is where my body is giving up you know and and you see that okay i am just human and and these are my limitations but but also on the flip side of it when you because there's no giving up right there's, there's no there's no scope of giving up anything right <laughs> so when you when you go in and when you see your body breaking and you see your your mind you know uh you know flying off and you see uh you you feel the 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 death hanging in the air you know the smell of blood and things like that all of that stuff you know it's very intense and in that moment you you have to evolve to survive so so uh um how should i put it so you you tap into something that you never knew you had every time mm. you know so it just starts building and building and building and by the you know uh, so so you learn humility uh, uh, you understand your body you understand your mind you understand your limitations but on, just in the same breath when when everything is like shit is in the air and that's when when you still somewhere from within your heart or something in from within your spirit that thing comes out and you take that boat and you get out and you evolve so you know so that's what it is i think simply put you, you know uh, yeah so the fantastic evolutionary experience as you you know grew a, as an officer i mean you also got promoted to captain and major and i mean could you tell us if you, do you start to see things at sort of a higher level and get this sort of like wider view of operations and command and uh, I, i'm just curious about kind of like that sort of like growth so okay i uh, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a weird one out of the bunch kind of a thing. So I, I had I had no ambitions as such. I had no ambition uh, to to rise in the ranks or to become a colonel or a brigadier or anything like that. I have uh, I have a very high degree of respect for uh, for my superiors and for and for for the men I used to work with, and uh, and it never really mattered to me that you know the whole rank thing and the whole command thing and all that because I, I've seen command failures happening. You may be a very, very senior officer and, and in combat, you're just, you know, you have no clue, mm. right? So, uh, and when bullets are flying, uh, you better be having a clue. Otherwise, people are not going to listen to you, right? So, especially hardened soldiers who know what they're doing, experienced soldiers who know what they're doing. If they get orders which are, you know, which are uh, which are uh, nonsensical, counterproductive, counterproductive mm -hmm. to the very mission that you're going in for. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, you become a very independent person. And since I I had no, uh, you know, I'm particular odd one out of the bunch. You know, that I never really uh, never really cared to go anywhere else rather than where I was already. So that's how more or less my life has been. That's how my approach even now is. Mm -hmm. So. So uh, uh, I got a uh, like I said I was very fortunate very early on you know uh, I got uh, I got tested very thoroughly because of the the double duration of probation that I did and then when I went into into combat my father and my parents brought me up to uh, to be to be respectful towards anyone uh, rather than to judge them and judge myself basis what their rank is or what their status in society is or things like that all that was got thrown out very early on in my childhood my father never uh, my father and mother both never never allowed uh, or never kind of 
propagated that kind of a thought process in us. My father was a very, very free, free human being, operated on his heart a lot. So that's what we kind of picked up and, and that translated very beautifully into combat. Uh, I, I never had, had to actually use my ranks. I hardly wore my ranks actually uh, <laughs> uh, during my service. And uh, 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 I was able to lead because I had the capability to lead. Mm -hmm. I had I was able to lead because uh, the men knew that uh, if shit hits the fan, this guy will be the first first guy there, and uh, you know we'll take it on together. And and it was always about the team. It was always about the team. That's why I left. Also, when I finished commanding a team, I left. So that was my highest high. I did not want to actually go and uh, you know just before I was becoming a lieutenant colonel, I decided that okay, you know. Uh, I'm, I don't want to tell people how to how to go into combat. I'd rather be there myself. And when I peaked out there, so I kind of transitioned out into the world outside to see what else is there. So, yeah. So uh, as far as um, uh, the ranks are concerned, uh, leadership is concerned. Uh, as far as uh, you know, going from a lieutenant to a captain to a major is concerned. The only thing that probably changed was a deeper understanding of the people that I was working with because I spent more time with them and also my knowledge base about the army and the world around outside over, over a period of time kept growing you know it was not because of the ranks but about because of the time that was passing by and how how I was being employed you know so uh, so ranks have never really meant much to me at a personal level mm -hmm. you know so yeah what your uh, and correct me if I'm wrong of Vivek, but your uh, your wasn't your career also cut short a little bit by a parachute accident, or did that happen afterwards? Yeah, so you know how things are in life. You know everything happens simultaneously. So when it happens, it happens together. So so I I I had a uh, uh, two things happened actually. A, I peaked out in, in combat. I peaked out in combat as in I had experienced uh, the highest level that I could think of as, as, a, as a special forces soldier. What was there in my mind that this would be the highest level of, of, of what one can experience, one can operate as to my satisfaction. I had, I had, I had already experienced that so, and I experienced, experienced all of this cumulatively over a, over a decade. So 10 years uh, out of the 14 years that I was in service, uh, you know, minus the training and all of that. Uh, so out of 14 years, yeah, almost a decade, I was continuously in combat. So, so uh, there's just so much that my mind opened up to and, uh, um, and uh, I peaked out and also simultaneously, uh, I had this uh, combat free fall. I was uh, undergoing combat free fall training, and and uh, I had a parachute malfunction. Uh, in fact, thrice. So, in my first com combat free fall jump, in my fourth jump, and finally in my eleventh jump, uh, 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 you know, it's like a horseshoe. Yeah, you know what a horseshoe is. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. So, so I had a horseshoe, you know, uh, high speed emergency three times. And, uh, the third, the third time that that happened, uh, actually went unconscious in, in, in free fall. Uh, and, uh, uh, luckily just before I went unconscious, I was able to, you know, get the handle out. And, uh, the, when the parachute opened up, basically it wrapped around my leg and, and my leg smashed my face. So I went out and, and, uh, I came to my senses uh, a little while later, and uh, I was uh, I was under canopy, and so I so I, I checked the altitude. I was at I was at two thousand feet, and uh, I had a semi deployed parachute. So you know about 30, 40 percent of it was more or less collapsed because all the rigging lines had gone over the over the parachute, and it was like almost about to collapse. So so I kind of you know stuck to it and flew down. I had a bad landing. And I injured my spine, uh, and uh, so I was in hospital for some time, and so all of these things happened together, kind of a thing, you know. And when I was in hospital, uh, 
I, I had some time to sit back and chew the cud, you know. So yeah, at life and see, you know, how life has been till that point of time. I was, I think, what thirty six years of age by then, thirty six, thirty seven, and uh, uh, I had time to reflect on life and 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 really see, you know, what is it that makes sense to me and what gives me meaning to to life and where do I want to go from here and things like that. So, so yeah, the, so all of these things came, came together and I decided that it's time to move on, time to move ahead, time to evolve further, time to uh, see what more life has to offer, right? So if you look at life in two spectrums, you know, everything is in... Uh, for anything to exist, it has to have its exact opposite there, right? For example, black to f have meaning, there has to be white. You understand black, uh, the color black. You understand it when when you when you when you see it relatively to white, right? Like good and evil, you know, black and white, you know, right and wrong, you know, things like that. So our entire construct of our reality exists in duality itself, right? For anything to exist, its exact opposite has to be there otherwise nothing exists take it so so what i realized is uh while i was in hospital that 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 there's destruction right and that's what special forces are supposed to be doing you're supposed to be you know one of the highest expressions of destructive energy right so when you when you go out there it could be anyone anything whatever right and you don't go out there thinking that you might lose. That question doesn't arise in your mind. What what is always there is is somehow you know I don't know. That's how it's always been for me, and I'm sure that's how it is for everybody else in the SF community. When you're going out there, you don't doubt yourself. You know, when you go out there, you know you kind of you decided in your head whether it, you know you in your mind. It's not about success and failure. It it's it's about reaching there and and doing it. There's you know. That's where it ends. It used to end in my mind. I never used to see post contact. It was always for me that, okay, this is what it is. I have to go there and I'm going to do it. And I go in there and I do it. That's it. No, no thinking too much around it about successes and failures and things like that. So, so as you, you know, over a period of time, you realize what it means to be a destructive form of energy, right? To be an expression of destructive form of energy and to be one of the highest expressions of destructive form of energy, right? For example, uh, nuclear weapons, right? The, the amount of destructive energy that a nuclear weapon has is, is phenomenal, right? It's, uh, you know, in the right amounts, it's life ending. And, uh, you know, uh, similarly kind of, you know, uh, special forces is also a, a very, very precise and high intensity, very focused expression of destructive energy. So I, I kind of peeked out there and there was nothing left. There was no higher high to be seen. There was no, uh, there was no nothing more to be done, nothing more to be achieved, nothing more to be realized about, about yourself in terms of this capability. It's kind of a realization. It may not have its, there are various ways it is expressed in the world. And, you know, depending on your ability to perceive you uh, and how open, how, how, how much your mind has opened up and how connected you are to actually what reality is you'll be able to see these kind of things so anyway so the destructive part got over and i really had nothing left i was just empty i did not want to do anything else i had no interest in anything else in life for me uh, i just kind of understood that this is all just a game it's just a game at the end of the day people shooting at people for some or the other reason right and and things like that so all these kind of things started coming up in my mind i also uh, a certain people like uh, people call it spiritual right they they associated with religion or, or spirituality or you know your higher self or, or whatever that it is it is called but there's a sense of awareness that starts opening up you know it's you know beyond the so-called matrix or whatever so you you start you know seeing you know and especially in the special forces and all you're you're exposed to a lot of uh, strategic thinking, and you understand where that strategic thinking is coming from. What is what is driving? What is the source from which you know strategic warfare is being thought from? So at some point I realized that it is ultimately a 
uh, the deepest sense of security which plays out into the highest expression of destruction the deepest sense of insecurity within an individual within an organization within a, a nation within a within a within a within any expanded sense of consciousness from an individual to to a nation or beyond right so when you are when you feel insecure and where do you feel insecure from you feel insecure because of lack of realizing what you really are right there are these um, you know you don't know what you are since you don't know what you are the world can appear very very threatening right there's there's always then the need to dominate the need to be better the need to be uh, to be greater the, all of these things come from from a very very deep sense of insecurity right so and and insecurity will always lead to uh, an aggressive and destructive expression of of what human capability can or cannot do right so all of these things i was able to zoom out and look at right and uh, uh it at some point just stopped it just stopped making sense to me right it's like a you know at a certain level the people who are actually guiding you know the use of special forces or the use of you know combat potential or combat power and all that they are not the people actually who are going down there and fighting right neither are they going down and you won't find their kids there either <laughs> right it's 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 you know people like us you 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 um, and especially special forces soldiers especially so uh, of course this kind of capability or this kind of awareness is there in all human beings but what happens in high intensity combat where life and death life and death life and death you're constantly on the cutting edge of that what happens is is that a lot of these latent potential potentialities which are there within you they start coming out they have to come out if they don't come out you won't make it right you it'll be you getting shot rather than you shooting someone you know it'll be uh, you know so so uh, so all of these things over a period of a decade it gave me a very very clear picture of how things are and, and what drives things and what is the source of of you know uh, ultimately when you when you look at the world you what do you see we are the highest species on this planet right so to speak you know human beings or uh, human beings are the highest species on the planet uh, there is nobody more intelligent or intellectually capable uh, as a species as compared to us that's what we believe right there's the animal kingdom is below in consciousness or awareness below us and the plant kingdom is further below because of we grade our our superiority uh, as a species or grade our position as a species in the entire you know uh, uh, biological spread on this planet uh, basis we grade we grade ourselves basis uh, basis our ability to think which other species don't apparently have right and look at us what are we doing you know we as human beings we have created boundaries on a planet right we have created these boundaries called it india pakistan china japan us this that we have created these boundaries who has created these boundaries has god created these boundaries no there are human beings like you and me who have created these boundaries and what do we do we the so called most uh, intelligent most intellectually capable most aware most conscious beings the highest the 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 alphas or the the this the, the so called guardians of earth the guardian species of earth that is what we would be right since we have the highest capability in terms of consciousness awareness thought capability and the ability to move energy around to create energy and to and to shift it around and to apply it we would we would we would look to to combine and evolve rather than uh divide and and uh dissolve you know we, we, are, we have if you just if you just look at at human species today right as as human beings you know forget the various boundaries that are there in our mind and and what differentiates us but look at what what is common amongst us you know we are all in the same boat right and the boat's kind of got a big hole in it you know and we can't constantly bailing water out nowadays right isn't it <laughs> like yeah. with the 
with all the climate change happening with with with, with uh, just look at where we are and where where the planet was let's say 100 years ago or 200 years ago you know mm-hmm. where we are today constantly on the brink of of destruction we have created a capability we have harnessed energy in such a way that we have harnessed the highest destructive potential of energy and created nuclear weapons to to account that's nobody's like business it's like we could destroy the earth uh, you know so many times over and get constantly as a species on that brink you know uh it's been done before there's there, there's you know we shouldn't be doubting that it can happen again so as the species which is capable of 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 all of that we are insecure we are insecure as a species and who are we insecure of we are insecure of each other mm. Mm-hmm. and since we are insecure of each other and we are constantly you know feeling that somebody might dominate me in the future and, and energy is limited and all of these things are limited and we have to fight with each other because you know we have to survive individually and and as nations or whatever so we have we have harnessed our potential to do to to do something the ability to create or the ability to destroy we have we, we have our our insecurity has led us to a, to a consciousness level where we are where we have directed our 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 maximum energy our maximum potential of of aggregating energy and doing something we have we have concentrated into the defense industry so as a species the biggest business the most the most focus of of our uh, uh, of our as human beings is to protect each other from each other that's where our maximum energy is going right now just imagine all these trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars which are being expended on human beings trying to build walls between each other i mean if all of that energy was focused on evolution itself of human species being able to live longer being able to become multiplanetary species to be forget about the future to be to be able to have a to be able to have a better today right You know, forget about it. Tomorrow, v- who's v- seen that? V- v- Vivek, as as you're, uh, you know, you're ex- thinking about all of these things and all of this sort of like this realization is occurring within you. Uh, could you tell us about what your personal evolution was like? I mean, you're you're speaking to these these big ter- these um big ideas, but I mean, umbrella, what, umbrella ideas, what, yeah. what what was the evolution for you like, like as a person, as a man? And what what was the next uh, that other part of your own duality that you explored in the aftermath of this injury? Yeah. So what I realized is essentially my sense of identity is stuck in my mind, right? What is my mind? My mind is my mind is a, is a, is a, is in my is basically the brain is a bunch of neuron neurons which are formed in a certain kind of pattern, right? And my sense of self of who am I of who I am is stuck inside of that. The, what how has that mind developed that mind has developed over a period of time basis my the dna that i had right from my parents and their experiences and my forefathers experiences etc that's the dna and then my mind is a product how i think and how i feel and what i know and what my awareness levels are where my sense of identity lies is basis the kind of experiences that i've had in life the kind of friends i had when i was growing up the kind of education that i that that my parents afforded me right the kind of uh, experiences how my father was with me how my mother was with me you know and you know uh, all the kind of all the experiences that one goes through in the social structure and finally when you you know go out into the big bad world and you you know you uh, you join a profession and and you get into uh, you, you know you get into the, your working life so your sense of i is uh, when it's stuck in the mind and that's what unfortunately that's that's how we are brought up you know we think we are the mind and what is the mind but just the product of your circumstances and your situation and and what you have experienced and what you were told what what life is all about right it's all about you know getting to some goal post right and and you know some kind of thing maybe so so all this somehow this life and death kind of thing that i kept seeing kept seeing kept seeing and seeing the the instantaneous how it vanishes and i it kind of focused to a point where i realized that actually the truth of everyone's life it's not just special forces soldiers it's not just firemen who are going into you know a building full of fire that who could die actually the state of human existence of all human beings who have ever been born and will ever be born is always life and death in the moment 
you you like a quantum element you know you exist and don't exist simultaneously any moment may may spell your death the you know an earthquake may come it's not you know most people don't die because of bullets you know there's just a million and one ways to die on this planet and and actually the truth of our existence is that that we that we are we are we are always living on the edge we just don't know it we're just not aware of it once you start realizing that you are living on the edge the way you look at life the kind of places that you would focus your energy the kind of things you would find your happiness from all of that will change so that's what happened to me right so uh uh i i kind of was able to step away from my mind and and look at life itself and look at the world and and see what drives people to do what they do and and how at various levels of you know as an as an individual and then as a society uh, uh, as a nation as as a, as one of the human beings on this planet etc etc so i kept zooming out zooming out zooming out and looking right and uh, so personally uh, a lot of foolish ideas in my head about what life means a lot of uh, i'll i'll not call it foolish what i would call it is an unexposed mind and unrealized mind right uh, a mind that that is uh, that is limited by what it thinks it knows so so all of that kind of fell away Mm-hmm. it just kept falling away i didn't realize it when i was in combat because i was totally i didn't think anything else i was uh i was i was very very focused for me uh, like i never used to ask for leave and things like that i never required to go off off tour off combat i always i i, uh, I hardly used to go home uh, nothing i was completely completely focused and dedicated to the next stop to the next stop to the next stop to the next stop that's how i lived my life right and and so i didn't have time or i never really stood back and looked at what i was doing while i was in it mm-hmm. but once i re, you know after a decade and all and i had that accident and then i was in hospital and then you know uh, i had time to reflect and chew the cud and 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 shed things and look at things as they are rather than how i think them to be so so personally it was uh, the evolution happened uh, uh uh to me or the awareness i would say it's not evolution too it's it's simply you become more aware of of yourself that's all it's you realize more about ra- yourself rather than evolve into something else the evolution is an expression but the evolution happens because there's a realization of what is already there within you so you just become you zoom in rather than you know your mind zooms in and you start looking at what you are and 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 you look back at your experiences and then you realize that fuck life's always been very very magical it's it's just a whole magical experience going on and you don't have to really you know uh, jump around and you know you don't have to go around breaking things you know you can go around making things and that's where uh, uh, that's where true realization of yourself lies and that's what i realized that actually what we are all seeking what we are all seeking individually as human beings is complete expression of yourself of realizing of your own potential expression of that so most of us don't know what we are so forget about you know realizing what you can do when you don't know what you are how will you know what you can do you'll never test it out even so there's always this longing within it's called that seeking right people travel around the world looking for new experiences and things like that people say i'm trying to find myself so they go around the whole world you know <laughs> going through these kind of experiences trying to find themselves right but that self is always within you and you're looking for it everywhere but within so it becomes uh, and many people get frustrated and and you know choose experiences from from a, from a non realized self point of view which you know you get a lot of boots up your backside over life you know life keeps kicking you and kicking you and kicking you and then one day the kicking becomes so much that you can't take it anymore and you stop so you stop and then there's nowhere to look but look within so when you start looking within and you start you know collating your experiences and drawing simple common sense inferences from that you start getting a different picture of what it is and what you're all about and then the expression of that starts changing so if you see our uh, the work that we do now is 
it's a very clear statement that is there in claw global you know it's from destruction to creation mm -hmm. yeah so we tell, uh, tell us about it yeah yeah, yeah please yeah. tell us about claw global yeah so so the that story starts off in in hospital right so so when i was in hospital uh, i was uh, you know going through some treatment. you mind if i smoke and have at it have at it we do all right okay so So this, this started off. So this started off in 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 in, in hospital, and uh, uh, there was this Air Force officer, right? He was a youngster. Uh, he he must be you know around 25, 26 years of age. Uh, he was in the in 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 the in the hospital room next to mine. So now this guy, he had uh, when he had just done about four years of service, he had dived into a swimming pool and hit his head and cracked his neck and got chest down paralyzed. So uh, when I met him, he had been in hospital for four years already. So four years of service oh, wow. plus four years. Yeah, four years he had been sitting in hospital and uh, he used to get uh, a month of leave every year from hospital, right? So, so two weeks in the summers and two weeks in the winters is what he used to go home for. The rest of his 11 months he used to, he had been in hospital for four years and and uh, a healthy guy getting instantly paralyzed, you know, uh, is, is a is a big shift. It's a very very big shift to digest. So, and he had just got married uh, one month prior to his accident. So, uh, so at night, you know, uh, you know, around ten ten thirty at night, uh, he used to get on a call with his family. And since I used to be in the next room, I I could hear, and there was a lot of stress. You know going on and this and that and and i used to watch him through the day as well he was trying you know he could hardly move his fingers and also he was he was uh you know trying to learn to type with a pencil and things like that and trying to build he knew that his his career is over and that he's going to be basically medically boarded out of of the air force so he had to think about a new life and everything was falling to shit around him right so all of this i could just assess over a period of two weeks that I was his neighbor. And then one day, you know, he, he kind of rolls up to me on his wheelchair and he asked me that, you know, sir, I've heard that that you are a, you are a, you know, a para commando and this, that, and, and like, do you guys, do you know how to scuba dive? You must be scuba diving. So I said, yeah, yeah we do and things. So he said, he, can a person like me also scuba dive? So this is back in uh, 2000, 2015. So, uh, so I said, I don't know. I don't know if a person like you can scuba dive, but you know, I can check it out. So I went back and, you know, I, I was kind of Googling and, and uh, I found this video of a lady called Sue Austin. She's a, she's a Britisher and she's also chest down paralyzed. And, and she, I found a video of her on YouTube where she was, uh, she was on a wheelchair and she had a scuba cylinder strapped to the back of her wheelchair and she had propellers and, and, and she had a, like a wing that she had created, uh, on the wheelchair and she was wearing a dress and she was doing ballet underwater. So, <laughs> yeah. So I showed it to this guy, you know, to the air force officer, I said, you know, it's possible, you know, see somebody's doing it already. So he looked at it and he said, sir, this is so complicated. You no, know, how will I do it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a brotherhood, you know, especially in these special forces, it's very, very pronounced. Uh, there's a brotherhood where, where you'll do, you know, it comes from your heart, you know? Uh, so I just told him, yeah, you don't worry about it. You know, I promise you, I'll take you diving one day. I just said it, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of a thing you do for anyone, right? It's, and that's this thing about being an SF soldier over a period of time, you realize you can do anything, anything, you know, the more, the more you spend time in combat, the more life and death you start seeing. So either you're going to land up with a, uh, with a very, very, uh, destroyed sense of self, you know, uh, where you will blame yourself. You will have a lot of guilt. You will have this, that, this, that, this, that very high intensity. Your nerves will be fried, etc., etc. That is one way that an SF soldier can go. We've seen a lot of combat. The other way that an SF soldier can, can go is, is to actually evolve and, and, and to put things in perspective and let go of a lot of, you know, past that that guy might be carrying around and, and actually 
understand for life or what it is that it is in the now and it's in the now that whatever you choose and you can create a destiny from there whatever it may be whatever mm -hmm. right so there's a kind of belief there so anyway so i told this guy you know i'll 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 take you diving one day so i started it became an operation for me by that time i had already decided that i'm not going to pick up a weapon again right so so i had decided that so i was in in you know in limbo i was basically yeah. floating in space i had no interest to do anything else in life all these various functions that are there in the world of people going to jobs earning money trying to you know do this or that trying to get accepted in their social circles you know uh, trying to buy material positions trying to uh, having ambitions about doing something great and fantastic some day that the world will recognize them and things like that all of that had just had no meaning for me zero zero meaning right not that i don't respect people who do that but for me it was it had no meaning it had gone beyond that right the very fragility of life and and and, and the senselessness of of our existence right uh, uh killed any amount, any interest that i had in in doing anything right what i actually wanted to do was i wanted to come out of the army i i i realized that i was I, there's there's just so much of pretense that one is carrying in his in their mind because because the entire thought process is, is fucked up and it's it's coming out of insecurity itself so you're trying to hide that insecurity by building you know personalities and building uh, successes and you know and and going out and throwing yourself in, in front of the world and and you know trying to find it's it's coming from an inner lack of realization of what you are that's why you're throwing yourself outside that that much right and that it's it's like a cat chase, a dog chasing its own tail it'll never catch it right <laughs> yeah, so yeah you keep going round and round and round in circles so until some day uh, the world comes crashing down and you're forced to stop or or you realize and you stop yourself and so i was at that stop myself stage i wanted to i had a dog i simply i had a very very simple plan i wanted to go climb a climb in the himalayas and and you know climb for a, you know go into the mountains seven days away from civilization chop wood build a log cabin plant the kind of vegetables that are you know that 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 grow around there so i can eat and if i want to eat meat i'll hunt and and i'll just stop just stop I'll stop worrying about the future. I'll stop reflecting on my past. I'll just stop and look at life for what it is, and zero out. Just zero out, you know. So because we are constantly, it's like you've got onto the wrong horse, you know, and it's running and it's running. It's a stallion, right? And you, but it's the wrong horse. It's running in the wrong direction, right? And you think that's what success is, and you're, you're riding it, and you're whipping, and it's galloping away. And at some point, your heart is getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier, right? Because you're sensing that this is not where I want to go. This is not this is not what I want to do. This has no meaning. But that's what the world says meaning is. So you're running behind that. So so somewhere I just wanted to stop thinking, and I also understood that this the brain of is, is plastic in nature, right? And it keeps it keeps forming these neural networks inside your head which become thought patterns every time an outside stimuli comes in the same you know process will circulate in your brain and the same kinds of thoughts will come out right so so uh, so i wanted to stop thinking stop being driven by my insecurities that oh i need to earn money to eat food i need to i need to do this to have any meaning in life i need to do that i need to be recognized or i need to be uh, i never had had any interest in being recognized by anyone right um, it's it's kind of a personality thing if you may call it but just like everybody else uh, i was you know in the constant seeking of meaning purpose meaning purpose you know all that so i just wanted to get off that horse and uh, stop so i was in that phase i want to go climb sit there for a year for 6 months not think anything just be just be that is what i wanted to do right but then this whole parachute accident thing happened and and then i met this guy in hospital i was a blank slate i had nowhere to go nothing to do no no interest no ambition no nothing and and then i met this this guy who's paralyzed and he says that he wants to learn scuba diving so i made him a promise i had all the time in the world i had it it kind of it came from the heart so i had the energy to pursue it 
right? So I started researching. So when I started researching, I found that there are you know more than 1.2 billion people with disabilities around the world, right? And then and and then I saw that uh, that there there are so many more people who are terminally ill, right? People who are going to die. People who have cancer, this, that, etc. And people who have not been fortunate enough. Ultimately, what is life? It's life is an opportunity to experience your highest dream. That's it. So, so many people who are going to die or who are on the verge of their deathbed, and uh, or, uh, you know, and they have not experienced a dream. So, uh, you know, their highest dream, like this guy, he wants to just scuba dive. You know, so why not? So, so, so then I started my my entire operational style of thinking went into play. That became the operation for me to get this guy to scuba dive. So, what I realized is it's all about value creation for large numbers, since there are so many. Uh, so many people like that around the world, you know, uh, who would have wishes like that. And if you could form a team that could that could fulfill those wishes, that would be uh, meaningful in life. So for me personally, and then I thought that okay, you know, then the whole ecosystem started coming out. People with disabilities, uh, since they are perceived for their weaknesses rather than assessed for what they can do, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is since they are perceived for what they can't do, they're already degraded, you know, uh, at, at a certain consciousness level where people, society looks at them for what they can't do. So they are never harnessed. But there are glaring examples, uh, uh, you know, like Stephen Hawking, right? He wrote one of the most profound books, you know, uh, of, of which human beings have ever written, you know, while being almost a vegetable, right? So... So, so there's just so much that a human being can do than just walking around, talking, or just you know doing whatever physical. There's just so much inside of us. So, uh, so I saw the entire ecosystem of of disability in the world, right? I thought I uh, I looked beyond boundaries. I looked beyond nations. I looked beyond uh, I looked beyond religion. I looked beyond all of these boundaries. These boundaries never really made any sense to me. And uh, 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 luckily, I was not weighed down by them. I had free thought, free flow. I could simply see it's like, you know, in the British SAS, they say, kiss, you know, keep it simple and stupid. Right, right. right? Yeah. So exactly that. That's, I think, one of the highest qualities and the highest things that I learned from the special forces, how to think simply. Right. And how to believe that you can go ahead and do it. Whatever you're thinking, you can do it since you can think it. It's a possibility. The difference between the possibility turning into a reality is whether you, you, it depends on your sense of belief and whether you take the step in that direction, and all the steps that need to be taken to reach your destination, right? So did, so, did you take this uh, yeah. paralyzed soldier scuba diving? Was that the, that the beginning yeah. of, of CLAW? So what we did is, so immediately after that, so I, I came out of the army, it took me, uh, it took me another year, uh, you know, for my pay, papers to get processed and I came out and I was at home and like I, like I said, I, I had zeroed out and uh, I was I went and bought a lot of wood and I was just making my furniture like I was filling my my house was empty. I had no possessions. Right. I never bought a car. I never bought anything. I had never no use for these things. Right. I used to have what four or five sets of clothes and that's about it. And that's more than what I needed, actually. So so I came out with nothing. I never saved any money while I was in service and things like that. I had I, had, I never thought about it. I never really knew actually while in service, I never knew how much my salary is, right? Because it just didn't matter, you know? So, yeah. 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 So anyway, so all of these things. So, so uh, when I came out, I was building this furniture and all. And then one day I got a call from one of the soldiers that I used to operate with, one of my teammates, you know, he called up and uh, he was also leaving the uh, he was leaving the army and he just called up and uh, uh he said that you know he asked me what am i doing so i told him i'm doing nothing so he said uh, okay great i'm coming to join you so 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 i said you know why are you coming to me you have a wife and you have two kids and things like that and he was one of the toughest like sf soldiers that i had come across right what a guy what a man what a heart what a body blessed Right. So this guy and uh, and he he wants to join me. And I just told him that I'm not doing I'm not doing anything and I can't take your responsibility. You're a guy who would get so much more when you go out. Right. Uh, 
but he just said ki uh, you know i just want to be with you so uh, so i said but i but i don't have anything i don't have any money i don't have anything i can't give you anything if i'm able to look after myself that is more than enough and that's what i want to do so so he said no i'm not worried about money uh, money we will make i just want to be with you let's be together so i said okay 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 so come so he came when he came so he was a he was quite an expert mountaineer you know uh, in the military and all that he had broken a lot of physical records a lot of technical and you know those kind of records he had created very very solid guy so uh, you know if there's just two of you in contact you know i would like that guy to be with me you know that kind of guy so 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 we kind of got together and then it started rolling you know the uh, you know very very quickly i found 10 of these ex sf soldiers sitting inside my house <laughs> right uh, and uh, uh, some of the navy marine commandos and all the navy sf guys also joined in so there was a joint team of the army and uh, navy ex veteran guys sitting together in the house and everybody is looking at each other okay let's do something together you know so i said you know uh, i've said it earlier as well and what i used to feel was that one day i was you know climbing a mountain and and it was the dawn was breaking and i was right on the like on the crest on, on the ridge line and i looked back and i was operating with with these five other soldiers we were six of us so i just looked at that th- that squad and this thing came out from my mind you know in in hindi in 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 our national language we say you know ki uh agar maine in bando ke sath doodh ki dukaan bhi khol di na you know to main puri north india ka supply utha dunga what it means is that when i looked at those guys i just looked at them and this thought struck me that with these that six of us if we open a milk shop also if we start selling milk right in a year's time i'll take the entire supply of north india i will i will own it <laughs> right so yeah so, so that's the kind of men you get to walk with right in the sf i think that's the biggest privilege you know so so uh, so with that thought so i told these guys you know that whatever we do in, in this world from here on you know together we'll do it together and and uh, uh, we'll we'll build we'll think together we'll operate together we'll we'll do everything together right and but before we go out to do that before we go out to do that uh, let us travel across the country and train as many people who are paralyzed we'll train them in scuba diving right so uh, as has always been the case with with the teams i have worked with you know the crazier the idea the faster the yes is you know <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah so 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 i said you know let's travel across india the across the entire length of india and uh, let's 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 train as many people with disabilities as we meet as many paralyzed people as we meet let's 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 introduce them to scuba diving and everybody said yes let's do it and that's when my life started changing when i actually started to see the magical side of the experience called life right so the reality reality of life is is singular but it how you experience it is it what defines life for you for anyone right so there's a 3d reality that that our mind is accustomed to operate in which we think that okay if i do this then that will happen and that will have cause and effect basically so so we are able to calculate a certain matrix that okay if i do this i meet this guy i have this network i will be able to do that okay if i have this kind of money i will be able to buy this and then i will be able to do that so that's how you that's how your brain works right 2 plus 2 equal to 4 4 plus 2 equal to 6 but there's a magical side of life as well which you which most people don't get to experience because we don't cross that threshold at all right that magical side of life is where 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 you are in alignment with the universe and things the universe starts throwing things at you magical things so we the last uh, we started off uh, 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 in 2020 and um, in fact 2019 we got together and over the last 4 years we have been living in a constant series of magic constant series of magic we are operating at magical level only right so what happened is we got together and then somebody called up some random guy called up from somewhere and you know i've heard about you guys and i would like to collaborate with you etc that's the first time i heard this word collaboration right so this guy calls up and he says you know i want to collaborate with you and i said okay what do you do so he said i've just opened up a dive shop i sell diving equipment 
said, fantastic. We don't have diving equipment. We plan to travel across the country and train as many people with disabilities that we find uh, in scuba diving. So we need gear. She said, fantastic. I'll send you the gear. So he sent us, he sent us, uh, uh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars worth of, you know, uh, you know, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment. He just sent it to us, right? With with nothing, no ask, no nothing. He said, use it. Whenever you're done, please, you know, send it back to me. So we had gear now. We had gear. We had the skills. So we had a little money left. So I, I sent the divers. We, we went to Thailand and and we we learned uh, a specialized course of how to teach people with disabilities uh, how to dive. We did that particular course and then we came back. And of course, all of the guys who were there with me, uh, they had about, you know, like 20,000, 30,000 hours of diving. So. Uh, very experienced bunch and now we were certified as well and then we we our journey started we started from my home where i am right now in chandigarh and we went to the spinal rehab center here that's the first like full-on exposure i had there were 24 people who were paralyzed in various stages of paralysis in that hospital and i saw them play wheelchair basketball and that's the roughest game of basketball that i ever seen in my life they were bashing each other out right you have to see people on wheelchairs playing basketball it's crazy the violence so so and then these guys come up and and we are in a room and i ask them okay you know so i'm major so and so and th these are our guys and we are all divers and and we'd like to you know anybody if you are interested in scuba diving we'd like to teach you you know all 24 all 24 paralyzed people people who could raise their hands who were waist down paralyzed raised their hands you know people who were neck down paralyzed and could not move their body opened their mouth and shouted you know all 24 shouted we want to do it and that shocked me so th that's where that that's where this whole ecosystem started opening up and uh uh we uh we trained all 24 of them you know uh, we've always lived on the fly whatever we've had we always go in having belief all the resources come at the right time the right place the right amount every time that's how we are operating right we're constantly operating like that so uh, none of us is rich or wealthy or things like that we never really care too much about these things but we are very very wealthy in the sense that it's like the universe is holding my bank account you know it's <laughs> wrong <laughs> so 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 you know it's once you understand you've seen death so much you don't really give a fuck you know you just go there and do it mm -hmm. you know the universe has to catch up with you you don't have to catch up with the universe it's like that well so, it sounds like the universe was making a lot of deposits in that bank account too uh vivek yeah it, it, it so had a, a lot for you, you to do <laughs> yeah 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 so it's just it, it's like money right people think to be successful to do anything in life you need money right but actually the things that are really worth doing they either cost too much money that you can never ever make in your life right or uh, they don't need money at all right in any case the rich person you know i understood money when i came outside what i understood about money is what is being rich being rich is having the right amount of money at the right point of time not a rupee more not a dollar less you know when you have a little bit too much you'll go and do something else rather than <laughs> what you really wanted to do right so if you have the right amount of money to the dollar, you have the right amount of money, you know, to do what you need to do right now. That's a rich man. Right. So so anyway, so that's how our, we have been operating. And then we traveled across the country. And, and what happened is we saw a phenomenal amount of healing happening. There was this lady who was for seven years, her left side was paralyzed. And we we took her diving five times, uh, you know, for five continuous sessions. We took her out, and her legs started moving. Wow. So, yeah, we've seen some cra crazy things. The speed with which the body responds, with, with how the mind starts healing, you know, all of these things started coming out. And all uh, as we started traveling across the country, and uh, so I started researching that why is it like this? Why is it? Why is where is this healing happening from? And why is it so rapid? So we, we started speaking to some doctors and things like that, started researching on the internet, found a lot of, you know, research documents on this, came up, you know, on the concept of death therapy, etc. Mm -hmm. So in the US, I, I believe it's quite popular where people who have got injured in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan who have lost limbs, etc. So they undergo something called death therapy, 
where they're exposed to either hyperbaric chambers or actual under scuba diving. Yeah. It speeds up. Yeah. So the science of it is basically it operates when you when you're at a certain depth underwater, your 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 DNA, uh, the ends of your DNA call your uh, telomeres, basically, that's they start lengthening and telomeres is what defines your regenerative capacity of your body. So every time the DNA divides, the, tel the telomeres goes shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So therefore, the speed with which you generate new cells becomes slower and slower and slower. So you grow old. Your ability to heal becomes more and lesser and lesser and lesser. So but when you die, when you die, when you go under certain uh, pressure, uh, in, and especially in an, uh, in an aquatic environment, when you're diving in the open sea and things like that, there's, a, there's an impact on your body right down to your DNA level. Uh, where where your telomeres start start regenerating, right? So your ability to reproduce new cells again gets jacked up, and also your mind, your mind starts expanding because it's a meditative experience. For 40 45 minutes in a dive, you're not you're not listening to anything, you're not thinking anything. You may be you know, uh, you know, uh, getting divorced on land, but when you're underwater, you will not think about it, right? You'll be just diving. So anyway. So we started decoding why this healing is happening. And by the time we, 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 we kind of, you know, uh, reached Bombay, it was very, very clear that this needs to be institutionalized. It, this kind of therapy needs to be institutionalized for people with disabilities because the healing is rapid, right? And, uh, and, and not only rapid, it stays. It's enduring, right? It's not that today you get therapy and tomorrow you go home and day after you're, you know, you're wanting to commit suicide again, right? It's not like that. So it's once you get sorted, it remains sorted for quite some time. It's sustainable. So, so I started speaking to a lot of people in our government and things like that, where I start saying, you know, we need to, we need to tap into this energy. There are, there are, you know, lacks of people like this who are, who are, who are, who are, who are not being tapped into their, their potential to, to do something in life is not being harnessed. That's just energy just lying wasted around. Right. And especially what is so special about 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 having a you know what does disability actually do to you it's like this you know when the chips are down and your back is against the wall that's when you fight the hardest that's when your best comes out right so so you can look at uh getting paralyzed or or pe uh, you know people who get disabled in some form or the other is that your back is against the wall right the only way out is that you have to believe in yourself you have to look within and and you know move out and also your other senses start getting enhanced, right? If your hearing goes a little low, your eyesight will go a little higher, you know, it compensates. So the body is pretty magical. So anyway, the long and short of the story is that we traveled across the country and we understood that that uh, this there needs to be an ecosystem which is created, which institutionalizes and offers these facilities, these healing opportunities, these regenerative op opportunities, these opportunities to tap into the human potential of people with disabilities, uh, uh, these need to be created. So th that is the overall solution that I came up with. We called it the human ability biomes. And and I went to a lot of government officials and spoke and this, that. And But what I realized is things don't move on ideas. Things move on successes, right? So success creates success. So need creates more need. So so uh i decided uh you know i just uh, and i throughout this entire journey that you know about a year we were traveling and i constantly found myself asking other people for things you know please give me this please give me that because i i need to take these guys out diving i need this i need that and i'm a person who doesn't believe in charity right it's it, it's a good thing empathy is a good thing but sympathy is just destructive right sympathy is just judgment empathy is is what you know when you feel for human beings uh, you know you can feel the other person's you know discomfort or pain or whatever that's useful but pity and charity uh you know when you feel pitiful for another person is is just gonna make you more stupider than you are and 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 never gonna get you anywhere right it's never gonna help anyone pity doesn't help anyone so so uh so i just took a break you know I just took a break and I and I went home. I was fed up of asking people for things and and constantly having to you know like moving around with a bowl you know asking people for give me this give me that. So I just went home and I took a break. I bought a whole case of beer 
and i i went to my mom's place and i parked on the carpet and i spent 3 days uh, drinking beer so i used to wake up in the morning i used to drink beer and go to sleep i used to wake up drink beer go to sleep uh, wake up drink beer go to sleep i lived in that cycle for 3 days i consciously switched off my mind and you know let everything go and just zeroed out and and just slept and drank beer and slept and drank beer and slept and drank beer on the fourth morning when i woke up i woke up with three world records in my mind i woke up with that i said okay you know it was just a complete solution um the first things the idea was as simple as it gets you know that we'll get a team of people with disabilities a team of people with disabilities coming from across the world across race culture class religion economic status or ability all of these differences that are there in our human perception and our mind and the way we look at things we'll get you know people with disabilities from across the world across all of these various boundaries and barriers that we have in our collective consciousness and we'll train them this so called weakest section of society the so called weakest section of society we'll get them across together and we'll train them we'll teach them how to skydive independently we'll teach them how to scuba dive independently and we'll teach them how to climb a mountain independently right and who will train them former special forces soldiers coming from across the world across race culture class religion nationality etc 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 an sf soldier is a soldier is a soldier is a soldier whichever uniform whichever flag whichever whatever he may walk under it's a spirit it's a mindset right human beings at the end of the day are human beings and a special forces soldier is a special kind of human being he's just more realized about himself his potential is more on tap than most other people right and in the the reason why a special forces soldier is there i say evolved more evolved because your circumstances make you and you're when you're constantly living in a situation where you could die you could die you could die you could die, you could die right and every time you come out winning is basically you're evolving evolving getting better and better 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 right at some point you leave the matrix right so it's just you have to constantly tap into what is there within you to be able to survive to the next moment and and survival for you you know other people call it you know may call it winning and victory and things like that but you just survived it's just got out of it because when a bullet leaves leaves the barrel it could go anywhere you know Could, so could you tell so, us about the the some of the endeavors that you have going on now that you kind of pr you pursued this these thoughts um you, you mentioned to me operation blue freedom and uh soul of steel some of these things that where where you've kind of evolved this uh this concept to it could tell tell us kind of like what's going on now where where these endeavors are at today I'll tell you so all of that those three world records is what is operation blue freedom the three world records that I woke up with on the fourth day that's operation blue freedom three world records in land air and water created by a team of people with disabilities coming from across the world across all these mental social barriers that we've got being trained by former gods of destruction ex special forces soldiers coming from across the world ex military veterans coming from across the world specialized in these various skill sets teaching the the the, the so called weakest section of society giving them the skills and sharing these skills with them to be able to to skydive independently scuba dive independently and climb a mountain independently three world records in all the three elements of land air and water right where what 99% of people in this world have not done the weaker section of society will come and show it and do it right so it will it will destroy the perception of weakness and disability that all of us carry in our minds all of us right disability is what disability is the inability to do something right and where does that inability ultimately lie it lies in the mind right so if you could just crack that you know worldwide if you could just crack it and who's doing it former special forces soldiers people who are at the peak epitome of destructive ability that at an individual level right you're not a machine you're a human being which is designed to destroy you're built trained equipped to destroy supremely efficiently that's what you're supposed to do anywhere across the globe in any kind of a scenario you fucking throw aliens at us we'll fucking kill them right <laughs> yeah that's what you believe that's what yeah. you believe otherwise you won't make it mm. right so 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 former so so former special forces veterans i 
So I felt that this kind of energy that this is kind of an energy that we share with people with disabilities because they are constantly having to navigate a minefield of, of the world around them. A guy on a wheelchair, you know, it's it's it, um, uh, it's it's very very difficult to for for that person to go outside his house and find a job and earn a living, right? It's very very difficult for that person to cross the street, right? Very very difficult for that person to use public transport, right? So his back is his life is a battle zone. So, so that guy, he can't give up. He can't afford to give up, right? And most people with disabilities don't have jobs because society perceives them as weak and perceives them as a problem and perceives them as, as something that, that takes too much of investment to really get any value out of. So all of these things, you know, so Operation Blue Freedom is, 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 the, is what this three world records are all about and all three elements of land, air and water. And we, we did the first world record uh, uh, end of last, last uh, in uh, end of uh, 2021. We climbed the world's highest battlefield, a team of eight people with disabilities. Unfortunately, it could not be an international team because the Siachen Glacier, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Uh, it's the world's highest battlefield. It's an active battle zone, right? Uh, goes up to altitudes of about 23, 24,000 feet. And uh, it's an entire glacier. So the the uh, the army is all parked on the glacier, You're basically living inside a fridge, right? So uh, we trained uh, we trained. So it's an active military zone. So we could not get clearances for foreign participants, but we were able to get clearances for an Indian team, and we we trained eight people with disabilities, four hundred percent blind people, you know, uh, people who can't see, hundred uh, percent visually impaired, three upper limb amputees, one. Leg amputee was a battle casualty. Uh, so eight people, we trained them and uh, uh, we did a nine day expedition into the glacier and back wow. successfully. Yeah. And we, so, so the idea was to a create these world records. We are going in for the second one. Uh, right now we are in negotiations with, with Dubai and with Thailand for the air world record. So these are three world records that we want to create at three different places around the world. We, we do not look at boundaries. We do not look, we do not operate on judgment. We operate on kind of a unifying thought process, you know, you know, divide and rule, unite and evolve, you know, so, so that kind of a mindset. So that's the three world records that we are doing. And, um, uh, uh the second one, uh, in fact, we'll, we're looking forward to some people coming in from the U S as well. And from various other countries from Canada, from, from Germany, etc. So a lot, a lot of, you know, that's catching up a lot of speed. So that's one thing that we are on. Uh, the idea for it's a it's a very simple business plan. If you if you if you want to call it that it's a uh, we want to the problem with 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 the disability sector worldwide. So I look at it unemotionally. I don't look at it with emotions and pity and charity and sympathy and things like that. I look at it as a problem that needs to be solved that can be solved. The problem with disability today is that it is spread across an entire spectrum and strewn across the world in little, little penny pockets, right? Right, right, right. There are diseases and things like that. It's an unaggregated sector. People are all, you know, and the biggest problem with this is, 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 is the research and funding part of it. Most NGOs, etc., spend most of the time trying to get money. So, you know, from CSR or from funding, from, from charity organizations, etc. So most of your effort is in trying to get money so that you can go out and do something right it's like when you're going into an operation you have to first convince your bosses to give you the bullets so that you can go and fight right so something like that so we we decided that we'll create a system where where everything will come on its own right we don't have to go seeking energy the energy will come by itself right so so we decided the first thing to do is change the perception towards human disability itself, the understanding of human ability, the understanding of human potential to change the perception of the world towards it. Right. So so the three world records are designed to do that, to change the perception worldwide. You create these three world records, film them and show this film to the rest of the world. Right. So you crack that, you crack the perception. The second thing is. Uh, to be able to generate the network capital, to collaborate with research organizations around the world, right? To collaborate with 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 employment uh, networks around the world, uh, to be able to come together and create the network, which 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 creates these human ability biomes, right? Where people with disabilities can come in and they can get 
they can get uh, access to the highest quality of uh, uh, rehabilitation, education, skilling, and connected up to an employment network. And in the background, so healing is definitely going to happen. You you give a person the right kind of environment, like we've been watching, tremendous amount of healing is happening. So we've got a team of researchers in the background, which is decoding this. This we've got, you know, we deploy biomedical devices and, you know, before diving, after diving, before this, before that, we change the diets, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. We work on the psychology and, and we give real world skill sets so that people can, can, can actually, become independent and earn money by themselves rather than having to depend on their families to feed them. Right. So, so it's an entire ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, when a person with disability comes in, when something that's supposedly broken, it comes in, it starts healing, it starts fixing. Right. So when it starts fixing automatically, we have these researchers in the background, which are picking up data. So over a period of time, what we believe is that this data will give out patterns. And what are these patterns? These patterns are basically, how to decode or unlock inner human potential, not only for people with disabilities, but for everyone. All human beings in this world today, except the so-called uh, enlightened ones, everybody else is operating below par. I know that for sure. <laughs> everybody is operating below par, right? We uh, So, uh, you know, it's a constant effort to become something rather than realize what you are, already are. So, so, uh, so we thought of this entire ecosystem and then we created the first human ability biome in, in Pondicherry in Auroville in India. It's in the southern part of India. It's an aqua biome. It's basically based around forest healing and and uh, and uh, underwater diving, etc. Now we are in the process of, of building a high altitude mountain biome, right? So whatever, you know, whatever events or whatever programs or whatever designs or whatever training that we come up with is all towards one and one target to create a human ability biome. That's it. So Operation Blue Freedom, the three world records are to create human ability biomes around the world. Every country has people with disabilities. Every country has got retiring military veterans, right, who are very, very specialized in their skill sets. So if, if we can create these ecosystems, human ability biomes in, in various countries around the world, where veterans coming in can have meaningful employment and can contribute to society like this, contribute the immense amount of skill sets and the mindset that they develop in combat, right? The heart, the ability to tap into their heart and spirit, that kind of thing. And there, of course, their skill sets in the mountains and nature, et cetera, et cetera, life skills, et cetera, whatever they are able to develop, they're able to share this with people, not only with people with disabilities, but with the society at large. You don't have to join a big corporate and become a you know tech guy or this guy or that guy, or you have to rewrite your whole life. You have to shed all the uh, all the capabilities and all the all the all the skill sets that you developed, all of that doesn't need to go to rubbish. Right. All of that can right, be really right. repurposed, repurposed and driven in this direction, which ultimately is leading to what realization of human potential, not only for people with disabilities, but for everyone across the world. So it's a large idea. It's a big thing, etc., etc., etc. But I've never felt that it's impossible. It's very, very practical, very, very simple, very, very stupid. And it's working. Right. So it, uh, it's working and uh, and even soul of steel. So soul of steel is again. Uh, a repurposing of veteran skill sets. So, like I said, we spent 15, 20 years in the mountains. We are operating in the mountains, constantly operating in the mountains. Now, civilian style of mountaineering, you know, when you go in for expeditions and things like that, it's a very, very planned thing. You have a peak, you know, you plan it and you go in and, you know, you have your challenges and, and things like that. But how how is military mountaineering different you know military mountaineering is obviously tuned to combat and tuned to endurance endurance ability in the mountains to be able to survive for extended periods of time in the mountains in high altitude right two weeks three weeks four weeks month two months three months being able to go into surveillance grids for that long right to survive that long you can't carry that kind of food on your rucksack you can't carry that kind of you know water and things like that you can carry only limited things so to be able to survive in extreme environments like that over extended durations of time. So we took those skill sets and the, the, the adventure side of monitoring skill sets, created a hybrid and created an, uh, created an event called Soul of Steel. What is Soul of Steel? Soul of Steel is being able, is, is a challenge, it's a seven day challenge in high altitude where you, uh, 
where a fusion of adventure skill sets in, in the mountains and military mountaineering skill sets come together, where not only do you have to navigate across an entire spread of hundreds of square kilometers, right? Uh, you have to navigate, you have to, uh, you'll be self-contained for a period of seven days. You'll be carrying whatever you can carry on your back. You would have decided your equipment that you've got. Uh, uh, you will be tested for emergency medical first response. You will be tested for your survival skill sets, your navigation skill sets. And of course, the various mil mountaineering skill sets of rock climbing, ice craft, snow craft, glacier marching, crevasse crossing, etc., etc., etc. All of this pooled together in a seven day challenge where you navigate from point to point to point. And uh, uh, again, it's a repurposing of veteran skill sets. We are creating ecosystems where veterans can walk in and we can harness the entire you know, mindset and skill set that they've developed over a period of time and share it with the society at large, right? Through meaningful things. At the end of the day, it's all linked to freedom. Everything that Claw Global does is linked to freedom, the sense of freedom, sense of freedom within, because we are getting to do what we believe in and sharing that with the rest of the world through skill sets, through sharing of mindset, so that everybody can feel that sense of freedom. The more we feel free, the less insecure we will be, and therefore the more chance to evolve. As uh, you know, you know, one man can't change the world, but you know, there's nothing better to do. So let's just try. You know. Do Do we have any questions for Vivek? Uh, we do. We have a couple. Uh, Danny, thank you very much. Uh, don't mean to get political, but I'd love to hear Vivek's thoughts on. Mm -hmm the border skirmishes clashes between China and India that started around 2020. Okay. What do I think about? So it's all about, again, I've kind of uh, said it earlier. It's somewhere in the nature of human beings to kind of judge, you know, the baseline, the judgment starts with a sense of insecurity. This is mine. That is yours. You know, 2000 years ago, it was like this 200 years back. I, you know, this was mine. That was yours, etc., etc., etc. Human beings living at a lower sense of consciousness, dividing themselves into various penny packets and fighting with each other. Right. And deploying their highest capability, their highest sense of potential, which is coming out of insecurity. That is why it is so. That is why it is so lethal. Why is it so deadly and why it is so distasteful, right? Where it's just dis distasteful. Just imagine like you and me, we're just regular human beings, right? You feel hungry. You feel the need for happiness. You need to feel the need for love. You need, you feel the need to be with your family. You feel to do some, do something meaningful in your life. When you're on your deathbed, it won't make a tack of a difference to you, whether, you know, whether you were, you know, uh, at the end of life, you know, all of these things don't make any sense. Since they don't make sense at the end of life when you have clarity that you're going to go away now, they shouldn't be making sense while you're living. So now when you translate that into into simple thing, you know, uh, what do I think about it? I think it is in the nature of human beings in any any form of consciousness, be it at, be it at, be it at identification with the religion, identification with the state, identification with the nation, identification with the particular racial group or whatever is a limitation and all of these limitations the greater their expression of limitations are the higher the higher the destructive potential of it is ultimately it's a game it's a game in which you see these players playing out their various parts that's how i see things personally speaking uh, is it can India and China really afford to go to war? I don't think so. I don't think anybody can afford to go to war in, in you know, really go to war in today's day and age. Right, right. Right. Especially big markets, especially neighbors, India and China. It's like it's like there's a it's like one body, you know, and wearing a shirt and a trouser. Right. And the shirt is telling the trouser that, you know, I'm better than you. And the trouser is telling the shirt I'm better than you. But actually, to, they need to be together. Right. So ultimately, these are just, you know, little, little games being played by big, big gods. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's what I think about it. How is it going to play out? You know, these things, uh, uh, it'll be foolish to try and predict how these things play out. I understand why they are so, right? I understand why, why it is so, why they're, why these things are there, but, but, uh, but that's 
that's the way of the world you know where where you find your differences and you and you create an experience of life i just i feel very disappointed when i look at the world today and i and uh, i i just i just feel that you know having been there on that side having understood what it means to destroy people to destroy things what it actually means rather than you know sitting and commenting on uh, on a on a linkedin or an instagram or there's so many people who have never fucking been there and they talk about you know they are they are you will hear them shouting the lo- largest yeah. the loudest right about about battles and and wars and who's superior and who's inferior and things like that so in my personal opinion the world will play itself out uh, you know india and china uh, i'm sure it's never going to translate into a war we can't be that stupid as as human beings that we you know two superpowers fucking destroy each other i mean like everybody will perish mm-hmm. right so nobody's going to allow that to happen in any case and today's wars are hybrid wars they're interdimensional wars right the wars are not just being fo- are no more being fought limited to battlefields they are being they are fought in across all dimensions right they are fought at a perceptual level there there's a lot of post posturing which happens there it it happens physically at certain levels that we are seeing at various hotspots around the world they happen uh uh in you know in the economic arena you know in the business arena and and in the corporate world and the all these you know in the stock market etc 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 it's just a valuation game you know at the end of the day so any other so that's questions? what I'm Uh Danny thanks again. Um does the Indian military incorporate uh any eastern spiritualistic practices such as mindfulness, meditation in the training? Okay. So if you if you look back into the history of India, right? If you look back into the history of India, uh all of these what are called eastern practices, right? All of these are actually spiritual practices or spiritual sciences the science of being a human being living at his highest potential right so meditation understanding the nature of duality nature of 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 uh, of the world itself nature of our existence all of these things have been written thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago in our uh, spiritual text called the vedas right down to you know subatomic levels and and uh, right down to 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 the uh, to the to uh, there's something called advaita vedanta the science of non duality right so uh, all of these things uh, are 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 pearls of wisdom pearls of real reality which have been decoded thousands and thousands and thousands <laughs> of years back where science is just arriving and saying yes the universe seems to, the multiverse it's a multiverse and it's holographic and there are many more dimensions than the, than the dimensions that our senses are able to perceive all of that is coming out in science now and speci- specifically in in quantum physics and all of that right so uh uh so yes uh, our very nature is is dipped in this spiritual spiritual outlook towards life and uh uh we we uh, we follow meditation we follow yogic practices and uh, uh we have a certain uh, it also translates into our mindset of how we look at combat itself so we are not an aggressive nation we don't look at you know going to, uh, uh aggressive and in a way we are uh, how should i say um we don't operate on insecurity we don't operate on this thing that somebody might overpower us tomorrow or somebody might conquer us tomorrow or somebody might you know do this or destroy us or weaken us or things like that we have an immense sense of self belief within our within within our forces at least and also within the government now and it's all this kind of coming together it's like a full circle happening right so uh, and the very basis of of our perception of our world around us as individual soldiers as a military uh, as as the armed forces uh, as, as as the government is the origin of it is is spiritual in nature mm-hmm. that so that actually of, yeah as i'm yeah. sorry because that that actually leads, uh, danny asked another question and i think this kind of leads into you talked about the vedas a bit but he asked about the bhagavad gita uh do you liken your military career 
to that of Arjuna uh, fulfilling his like his war, his dharma, uh, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita. Is that and not just for you personally, but is that a, a theme, uh, sort of in the air, in the Indian military, the idea of, of dharma that it's it's a duty or, or a yes, yes. We are a uh, firstly we are a protective force. Mm -hmm. We we. We are not an uh, the need for aggression. Uh, we are able to be aggressive, but it is ultimately to protect and protect protect what is ours and what is within, right? To protect protect the natural resources of our nation, protect the people, the human beings that live in our nation, the children that are growing up and and having giving affording a certain sense of stability to uh, to 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 the society that that lies within the borders, right? We, within the protective shield of the armed forces right so that people can go to school educate themselves people can have uh, uh, access to services like hospitals and things like that and have a peaceful peaceful existence uh, you know in this geographical area so that we can we can move towards realizing our higher self so yes uh, 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 India, largely speaking, you know, everybody has their problems. It's not a perfect world, and and good thing it's not a perfect world. Mm -hmm. If it were a perfect world, we'd have nothing to do, right? So, 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 so the source of it, even though, uh, uh, even though you know, there's been a delink, uh, and all of this is just my opinion, my perception as a common man, mm -hmm. right? I'm not a very educated person in the sense that I've read a lot of, you know, geopolitics or or, or I've, or, you know, surfed the internet to understand, you know, uh, who's greater than who or who's fighting whom and for what reasons. I don't really spend too much of time doing that. My hands are full with what I'm doing right now. So, uh, but what I have understood is is that there will always, for for human experience to exist, there has to be duality, right? our experience happens within the framework of duality so so there will always be winners and losers and there will always be you know joys and sorrows there will always be good and evil and things like that and within that spectrum we will find our expression and uh, uh, ultimately uh, 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 it's it's about it's about learning to live together and 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 uniting uniting our specialities all human beings are unique right you 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 know what people don't understand is a very simple thing like for example jack right in the history of humanity and in the eternity of time in the future let's say we live we have an eternal future in, in front of us as human beings uh, 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 in this entire expanse of time history of humanity till the eternity of 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 the future there never ever has been a Jack Murphy who was born, who looked like you, talked like you, thought <laughs> like you, had the same experiences like you ever before, and will never ever happen again. Some people You're are born. grateful for that, Vivek. That's only because you don't have an only fans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so essentially speaking, yeah. our very existence in India, our very existence is rooted in spirituality. It's rooted mm -hmm. in it. That is our origin. That is our source. And that is the origin or that is the source from which our expressions come out there are of course there is a long way to go to to go back to a full expression and uh, but then the journey is the reason right so any any uh, other questions actually d were there any patreon questions oh, i don't think so no okay um vivek any final uh, words that you'd like to leave the audience with um and and please let us know uh, where folks can find you, where they can find CLAW, people who want to get involved. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> first things first, I would like to, like I've spoken about Operation Blue Feed in the Triple World Records, where the vision is people with disabilities coming from around the world, across all these social barriers, and, and former military veterans, special forces soldiers, specialized in skydiving, scuba diving, mountaineering, coming together from around the world. If there is any ex, you know, any veteran who feels that you know this is something that like this is a journey that interests him that he would like to know more and probably walk with us on it you know most welcome you can visit us on claw.global uh, c-l-a-w dot global so c-l-a-w is basically conquer land air water that's like the full name of it and you can you know you can come out and explore what we are doing more and if it makes sense to you just drop in a mail and we will take it ahead from there that's one 
The second thing is is from a just a, from a common man's point of view, just a human being who who is existing now and you know may not exist in the future. So it's a simple sharing that uh, that 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 you know it's a very very small infinite life that we live. Very very small. It's like a flash in the pan, right? So compared to the whole of human existence and all the human beings that have existed and who will exist in the future. So it's you are just just you know I'm just a splash in the pan, but but make that flash in the pan you know worth your while. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And the way to doing that is to rid yourself, rid your own brain, rid yourself of judgment, rid rid yourself of judgment of the outside world, rid yourself of judgment of your own self. You know. Just let yourself be, and 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 uh, uh, and and let yourself come out. If you let yourself be, and you if you're if you're driven by by your heart, uh, you will find the full expression of your flash in the pan. You know, so that that's it. That's it. The fact. One, one more. Yes, please. Sorry. Yeah. So soul of steel. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, soul of steel is about again showcasing military veteran skill sets and mindsets being applied and repurposed and focused at at developing a sense of security, a sense of skill skill and ability in the larger population in the in the world outside. We have something as as special forces veterans, as military veterans, we have a certain advantage. Compared to other professions, the advantage is this: that we are, we are since we have constantly and constantly over extended pure periods of time, living in the now and in the now where you can perish any moment, any moment, any moment. So what happens is when you constantly live like that, the meaning of life, the preciousness of life itself starts, you know, taking expanding and expanding, and, and the realization happens. So, so, so. Uh, uh, sharing these skill sets with the world outside at large will will create a sense of of self belief and ability in the world general world outside. I think that's where military veterans have a very 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 priceless role to play in the larger society of this world. Forget about boundaries. Forget about nations and countries and and insecurities and who's greater and who's smaller. But just as military veterans, since we have this advantage of having realized so much of life through real experiences of life and death, and really understanding what it means to be alive and to breathe and to be able to do something, right? So, since we are in that position of realization, of that position of having ability and skill set and a mindset. That that even the worst of circumstances will always see that ray of ray of light rather than the darkness around us, right? So if if we share this with the world outside, with people who are not as fortunate to have gone through the experiences that we have gone through, to realize the things that we have realized, to realize the sense of self belief that we have within, it's it's the greatest thing that that a a, a military veteran can do is, is to share his his. His abilities and his thought process and his spirit and his energy towards creation and towards you know divide and rule or unite and evolve. You know, so the question is very very uh, the 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 what's on the table is very very clear. So uh, anybody who would you know want to associate with us any which way, if you want to come in and compete in Soul of Steel, you want to come in as a training team in in Soul of Steel, you want to you know you want to share your skill sets, you want to interact more with Claw Global, you want to understand what we are doing and why we are doing it. You're most welcome, and uh, uh, you know, see you on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Vivek, thank you so much for sharing your journey and your vision with us, man. And I think it's really important, and uh, I'm glad, or, and, and I hope that a lot of people will hear it. It's, it's, it's. Um, I don't know. It's really. I, I'm really gr grateful and thankful for for opportunities like this, where you know, where where we are able to share how we feel and we think. With other people around us, and and it, this is, I think, the first time I'm 
I'm speaking on an international platform, mm. right? Outside my own country. And uh, I'm able to, through you, through this opportunity that you have created, that you have thought of, right? It's discussions like this is which, you know, open up so many windows of perception that other people didn't know existed mm -hmm. and makes the world a little better place than, you know, before we started an hour, hour and a half ago. That's and all. and I, I don't think we've ever done such a sort of deep dive on transitioning from a special forces career to a civilian life, not not just civilian life, but tr the transformation of the self that you describe. I mean, we've never really gone this in depth with it. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the conversation. And um, folks uh, out there on Monday, we'll be back on Monday the 13th. Uh, Gary Harrington is going to be on the show, a guy who served in JSOC and the CIA. Excited to talk to him as well. Uh, Vivek, I can't thank you enough, man. Again, I hope folks will go and check out claw.global. Get involved in your organization and all the great things you're doing. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Adios. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Bye. We'll see Bye. everyone on Friday and then again, or I'm sorry, we'll see you all on Monday and then again on Friday. So take care. We'll see you then. All right. See you, see you guys. Thank you so much.